In this sketch, we'll focus on one of the most common winter illnesses in kids. Bronchiolitis. <laughs> it's also one of the most frustrating illnesses for pediatricians and parents alike, so stay tuned to find out why. For this sketch, we'll venture into a wintry forest of never-before-seen snow-covered bronchial trees. Except something's strange about this forest. It appears to be occupied by some ghostly campers. But these specters don't seem that spooky. In fact, they appear downright friendly. So hop into your up-and-at-em machines and let's dive in. Bronchiolitis, depicted by the inflamed red fruits on the tips of the bronchial trees, is a viral process characterized by initial upper respiratory symptoms, such as rhinorrhea and nasal congestion, that progresses to a prominent lower respiratory inflammatory process. The most common cause of bronchiolitis, seen in 80% of patients, is respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV. Gasper, the friendly ghost, the mascot of this ghost camp, is chillin' next to an RSV tombstone to help remind you of this. Other possible viral causes of bronchiolitis include rhinovirus, parainfluenza, cumin metanumovirus, influenza, adenovirus, and coronavirus. The regular one. We're not talking COVID here. The clinical features of bronchiolitis are the same, regardless of the causative virus, but RSV and co-infection with multiple viruses tends to cause more severe disease. Bronchiolitis is the number one reason for hospitalization among infants and young children in the USA, which is why the number one on this tombstone is the only number that hasn't faded away. So, what happens physiologically to the airways in bronchiolitis? The viral infection leads to lower respiratory airway edema, represented by these icicles dripping fluid off the bronchial tree branches, increased mucus production, depicted by this sticky accumulation of sap, and eventually sloughing and necrosis of epithelial cells within the airway, denoted by the sloughing bark breaking off of the tree. Just looking at this picture of goopy, drippy, shedding bronchioles makes me want to get bronchiolitis. Um... Never. All of these changes lead to obstruction of the lower airway, kinda like how this chubby squirrel is now obstructing this hole in the tree. Someone ate a few too many nuts today. There's a classic pattern to the disease course of bronchiolitis, and knowing this pattern will help as you assess a patient's clinical status. There's an initial prodrome of pretty standard upper respiratory symptoms, for example, rhinorrhea and nasal congestion, which is then followed by the onset of lower respiratory symptoms, which includes cough, trouble breathing, and wheezing and or crackles two to three days later. These lower respiratory symptoms generally peak in severity around days three to five. We'll talk a lot more about the details in just a second when we review the history and physical exam. You might hear pediatricians refer to the winter as bronchiolitis season because, at least in the northern hemisphere, it affects patients primarily in the fall and winter. That's why the Gasper Ghost Camp is held in the dead of winter. I prefer a nice warm summer camp, but that's just me. So, who tends to get bronchiolitis? Bronchiolitis usually affects children two years of age and younger represented by the two candles on Gasper's birthday cake. Or I guess it's his death day cake? Do ghosts even eat cake? Or eat at all? Egon, I have questions for you. Kids under six months of age, and especially those under three months of age, are at risk for more severe illness. You can see this depicted by this rough-looking corporeal cake, which only has half a candle. I guess ghosts don't like real cakes. Noted. So, how do kids with bronchiolitis typically present? They will come in with a cough, represented by this puff of air coming from Gasper, as well as a fever, which is seen in about 50% of cases and is depicted by Gasper's flaming head. Getting a good history is also important, as patients will often have had an upper respiratory prodrome, usually consisting of a runny or stuffy nose, and pictured here by the ghost mom blowing her nasty, or shall we say ghastly, nose boogers. Gives a new meaning to the term boogeyman, doesn't it? Get 
down, buggy, uggy, uggy. Uh, where was I? These nasal symptoms typically last for a couple days, followed by the onset of cough and trouble breathing. Looks like the ghost dad is coming down with something, too. Infants less than two months of age may present with apnea alone and no other bronchiolitis symptoms, shown here by this apneic ghost baby. Parents may also report that their child is making fewer wet diapers than usual. This trickling sap from the bronchial tree and this puddle of yellow snow should help remind you of this. This can be a sign of dehydration related to insensible losses from their increased respiratory effort and or from decreased PO intake secondary to nasal congestion or reduced energy, represented by this falling slice of cake. When I'm sick, I certainly don't want to eat much either, but I'd have to be pretty darn sick to pass up chocolate cake. Mm -hmm. When taking your history, be sure to ask about risk factors that can increase the chance of more severe disease. An age under 12 weeks and a history of prematurity can both put an infant at risk for more severe disease. You can see this represented by these three moon eggs. One moon covers the span of one month, remember? And this tiny owl that has hatched prematurely. In the case of premature infants, this increased bronchiolitis risk is because they have a greater chance of having underlying laryngo or tracheal malacia, or a floppy airway, and may have missed the maternal transfer of some protective antibodies in utero. Other risk factors for severe bronchiolitis include chronic lung disease or bronchopulmonary dysplasia, represented by these wilty, lung-shaped leaves, hemodynamically significant congenital heart disease, depicted by this jagged, crossed-out heart carving on the tree, daycare attendance, symbolized by this little gathering of ghost kids around the campfire, having school-aged siblings, aw, oh, look, little ghost twins, secondhand smoke exposure at home, see the smoke coming from the fire, and a lack of breastfeeding in early infancy, hence this formula bottle. The next clue to a diagnosis of bronchiolitis is your physical exam. Pay careful attention to the lung exam, as that will usually really cinch the diagnosis. Don't forget to check and review vital signs for all of these kids. In addition to a fever, persistent or transient oxygen desaturations may also be present. You can see this represented by this living boy who, with the help of his glowing red ghost detector ring, has stumbled onto the ghost camp. You may also see tachycardia, which is depicted by his elevated heart watch. Next up after vital signs, be sure to check the overall appearance and mental status of these kids. Altered mental status, manifesting as lethargy, increased sleepiness, or decreased interaction with others, may be a sign of more severe illness, and is represented here by our ghost-detecting kid, who is scratching his head in confusion. I'd be a little perplexed myself if I stumbled on a group of ghosts sitting around a campfire, let alone one drinking from a baby bottle, no less. Next, you'll want to check for signs of dehydration, depicted here by this falling water bottle. Signs of dehydration can include dry mucous membranes, a sunken fontanelle in infants, and or delayed capillary refill and poor skin turgor. Next up is your lung exam. Before jumping to auscultation, check for signs of respiratory distress. These include nasal flaring, which is a reflection of increased airway resistance, grunting, which is the body's clever way to create auto-peep, or positive end expiratory pressure, to help keep the airways open, accessory muscle use, like belly breathing, retractions, which may be subcostal, intercostal, and or supraclavicular, and tachypnea, you can see these signs represented by our living kid who is huffing and puffing so much after his encounter with the ghostly campers that he has stretch marks on his jacket. Okay, okay, okay. Now you can listen. On lung auscultation, you may hear rails or fine crackles, which, if you remember, sound a bit like opening Velcro, kind of like the straps on our ghost hunting kid's shoes. You may also hear expiratory wheezing, which reflects lower airway obstruction. Wheezes often sound similar to a whistle, which is why we've depicted them here with an actual whistle around our ghost hunter's neck. Be sure to check for air movement as well, since a child with severely obstructed airways may not demonstrate much wheezing if they are moving little air. 
In these kids, it can sometimes be difficult to distinguish transmitted upper airway noises from their rhinorrhea and nasal congestion from lower airway noises. A helpful tip is to put your stethoscope in front of your patient's mouth and nose, then compare those sounds to what you hear on your lung exam. Transmitted upper airway sounds will be the same in both places, whereas lower airway noises should only be present when auscultating the lungs. Bronchiolitis is a clinical diagnosis. Lab work is not routinely indicated, especially for your run-of-the-mill case in the outpatient setting. Viral panels can be considered for hospitalized patients or for those whom the viral panel result might change clinical management. Note that we're not talking about the workup of fever in a neonate here. That's a horse of a different color and outside the scope of this sketch. Imaging is also not routinely indicated in bronchiolitis. The American Academy of Pediatrics, AAP, policy is to avoid imaging in routine bronchiolitis patients, since the hyperinflation, scattered atelectasis, and infiltrates commonly seen do not correlate well with clinical disease severity, and finding them can lead to the administration of unnecessary antibiotics. But... If your patient's presentation is severe enough for an ICU admission, or if there's concern for a possible complication like secondary bacterial pneumonia, then for sure you can go ahead and order that chest x-ray. Chest x-rays in patients with bronchiolitis typically reveal peribronchial cuffing, represented by this hand warmer wrapped around this tree branch, hyperinflation depicted by these overinflated balloons, and or atelectasis represented by these shriveled collapsed balloons. With a consistent history and supporting physical exam findings, you're just about ready to diagnose your patient with bronchiolitis, but it's always a good idea to run through a differential quickly to ensure you're not missing something. Common differentials for bronchiolitis include viral-triggered asthma exacerbation, bacterial pneumonia, pertussis, and foreign body aspiration. Head on over to the differential diagnosis menu to learn more.